Good morning, everyone. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all, wherever you may be. On behalf of Father Blaney, your parish pastoral council, and all those volunteers who have stepped forward to help facilitate our return to worship here in St. Malachy's once more. Even though it is wonderful to be able to celebrate all the Easter ceremonies this year, we still must be crucially aware that the diocese have asked us to observe all necessary precautions. Therefore, in order to enjoy our celebrations of the liturgy in a prayerful and reverential manner, and with your safety in mind, I'll just lead you through a few practical arrangements. You will notice that we are very fortunate to have Maggie Ferris Curran and John Cunning here to enhance our liturgy with music. I know that it often comes automatically to join in with the singing, but we would advise you to resist that urge and just allow Maggie and Father Blaney to be all our voices for this year. At communion time, please wait for Stuart to call each of you forward. Come down the middle aisle and back to your seats round the side. I would ask the people on this side coming to Father Blaney when they're going back to their seat to go back on the other side of the pillar because Maggie and John are on this side of the pillar. Those who are seated in Our Lady's altar will wait until all the main body of the church have received communion. Then a steward will call each row forward to receive the Eucharist from the minister. At the end of Mass, as usual, we would ask you to wipe your seats with the antibacterial wipes provided, and again, just wait for the steward to guide you as you leave the church. And for your own safety, as well as the safety of others, we would ask you to avoid gathering together outside the church and leave the church grounds as promptly as possible. I know that's a lot to take in, but I thank you all for listening, and we all appreciate your patience and your cooperation in these very different and very difficult times. God bless you all. Thank you. So today and uh, in the days of the week ahead, our focus will be very much on the cross and on the 
account and story of the last week in the life of Jesus. And that brings us to the, to the other feasts of the week, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, the day of the Lord's Passion, and then moving into the resurrection and new life on Saturday night and Sunday morning. So we begin with using the sign of the cross to bless ourselves and everyone that we think of and pray for in this Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, good morning then, everyone. Uh, you've already been welcomed and instructed. I would just like to extend that same welcome to you, but also to the many people who join us on the media and on the streaming and all the different ways of communicating and receiving uh, the message and the blessing of the Mass. Uh, indeed, I would know myself that as far away as Australia and New York and all parts of Ireland, there are people who zoom in to uh, perhaps this Mass today and during the week. So we welcome them and welcome them as part of our community, not just absentees, but people who are in mind and heart with us uh, during this great prayer. First of all, we remember that Jesus planned, uh, planned the feast of the Passover with his disciples, and he instructed them to how to set the place up, the upper room, and so on. And then he made his way on the beginning of his journey uh, into Jerusalem from the villages round about Pe Bethphage and uh, Bethany and so on. And those are all important places in the life of Jesus. And so we bless the palms now. And if you have palms in your hand, you can hold them up and we'll bless those too. Almighty and ever living God, sanctify each of these branches with palms. And the palms that you hold and bring to your homes as reminders of the daily passion and the daily worries and sorrows of, of yourselves and your families in the year ahead. So bless them, Lord. With your blessing, that we who follow Christ the King in joy and exaltation may reach the eternal Jerusalem through him who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. So, the journey that Jesus makes, we also make our personal journey. And in our personal journey, we know that we need reconciliation and peace. So Lord Jesus, you came to reconcile us to one another and to the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you heal the wounds of sin and division. Christ, have mercy. And Lord Jesus, you intercede for us with your Father. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy in us forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. So let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who, as an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Saviour to take flesh and submit to the cross, graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient suffering and so merit a share in his resurrection who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So let us now sit for the readings. We have moved to page four in, in your booklets. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God has given me a disciple's tongue so that I may know how to reply to the wearied. He provides me with speech. 
Each morning he wakes me to hear, to listen like a disciple. The Lord has opened my ear. For my part, I made no resistance, neither did I turn away. I offered my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who tore at my beard. I did not cover my face against insult and spittle. The Lord comes to my help so that I am untouched by the insults. So too, I set my face like flint. I know I shall not be shamed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All who see me deride me. They curl their lips. They toss their heads. He trusted in the Lord. Let him save him. Let him release him if this is his friend. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many dogs have surrounded me. A band of the wicked beset me. They tear holes in my hands and my feet. I can count every one of my bones. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They divide my clothing among them. They cast lots for my robe. O Lord, do not leave me alone. My strength, make haste to help me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I will tell of your name to my brethren and praise you where they are assembled. You who fear the Lord, give him praise. All sons of Jacob, give him glory. Revere him, Israel's sons. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. His state was divine, yet Christ did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave and became as men are. And being as all men are, he was humbler yet, even to accepting death, death on a cross. But God raised him high and gave him the name which is above all other names, so that all beings in the heaven, on earth and in the underworld, should bend the knee at the name of Jesus, and that every tongue should acclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, to the glory of of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Christ was humbler yet, even to accepting death, death on a cross. But God raised him high and gave him the name which is above all names. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. And just during the reading of the Passion and listening to the story, if you wish to remain standing, yes, do so, or if you feel uh, more comfortable, uh, please feel free to be seated. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. It was two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by some trick and have him put to death. For they said, It must not be during the festivities, or there will be a disturbance among the people. Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. He was at dinner when a woman came in with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the ointment on his head. Some who were there said to one another indignantly, and they were angry with her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why are you upsetting her? 
What he has done for me is one of the good works. You have the poor with you always, and you can be kind to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what was in her power to do. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. I tell you solemnly, wherever throughout all the world the good news is proclaimed, what she has done will be told also in remembrance of her. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, approached the chief priests with an offer to hand Jesus over to them. They were delighted to hear it and promised to give him money. And he looked for a way of betraying him when the opportunity should occur. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and you will meet a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him and say to the owner of the house which he enters, the master says, where is my dining room in which I can eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished with couches, all prepared, so make the preparations for us there. The disciples set out and went into the city and found everything as he had told them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, he arrived with the twelve. And while they were at table eating, Jesus said, I tell you solemnly, one of you is about to betray me, one of you eating with me. They were distressed and asked him, one after another. Not I, surely. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping into the same dish with me. Yes, the Son of Man is going to his fate, as the scriptures say he will. But alas for that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Better for that man if he had never been born. And as they were eating, he took some bread. And when he had said the blessing, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had returned thanks, he gave it to them. And all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, the blood of the covenant which is to be poured out for many. I tell you solemnly, I shall not drink any more wine until the day I drink the new wine in the kingdom of God. After psalms had been sung, they left for the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all lose faith, for the scripture says, I shall strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. However, after my resurrection, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said, Even if all lose faith, I will not. And Jesus said to him, I tell you solemnly, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will have disowned me three times. But he repeated still more earnestly, If I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And they all said the same. They came to a small estate called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Stay here while I pray. Then he took with him Peter and James and John, and a sudden fear came over him, and great distress, and he said to them, My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Wait here and keep awake. And going on a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, this hour might pass him by. He said, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup away from me, but let it be as you, not I, would have it. He came back and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Had you not the strength to keep awake one hour? You should be awake and praying not to be put to the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came back and found them sleeping. Their eyes were so heavy, and they could find no answer for him. 
he came back a third time and said to them, You can sleep on now and take your rest. It is all over. The hour has come. Now the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us go. My betrayer is close at hand already. Even while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up with a number of men armed with swords and clubs, sent by the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the traitor had arranged a signal with them. He had said, The one I kiss, he is the man. Take him in charge and see he is well guarded when you lead him away. So when the traitor came, he went straight up to Jesus and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The others seized him and took him in charge. Then one of the bystanders drew his sword and struck out at the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. Then Jesus spoke. Am I a brigand that you had to set out to capture me with swords and clubs? I was among you teaching in the temple day after day, and you never laid hands on me, but this is to fulfill the scriptures. And they all deserted him and ran away. A young man who followed him had nothing on but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the cloth in their hands and ran away naked. They led Jesus off to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes assembled there. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the high priest's palace, and was sitting with the attendants, warming himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus, on which they might might pass the death sentence, but they could not find any. Several, indeed, brought false evidence against him, but their evidence was conflicting. Some stood up and submitted this false evidence against him. We heard him. (coughs) But even on this point, their evidence was conflicting. The high priest then stood up before the whole assembly and put this question to Jesus. Have you no answer to that? What is this evidence these men are bringing against you? But he was silent and made no answer at all. The high priest put a second question to him. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his robes and said, What need of witnesses have we now? You heard the blasphemy. What is your finding? They all gave their verdict. He deserved to die. Some of them started spitting at him and blindfolding him, began hitting him with their fists and shouting, and the attendants rained blows on him. While Peter was down below in the courtyard, one of the high priest's servant girls came up. She saw Peter warming himself there, stared at him and said, You too were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know, I do not understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt, The servant girl saw him and again started telling the bystanders, This fellow is one of them. But he again denied it. A little later, the bystanders themselves said to Peter, But he started calling curses on himself and swearing, I do not know the man you speak of. At that moment, the cock crew for the second time, and Peter recalled how Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will have disowned me three times. And he burst into tears. First thing in the morning, the chief priest, together with the elders and scribes, in short, the whole Sanhedrin, had their plan ready. 
they had Jesus bound and took him away and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him. Are you king of the Jews? He answered. It is you who say it. And the chief priests brought many accusations against him. Pilate questioned him again. Have you no, no reply at all? See how many accusations they are bringing against you. But to Pilate's amazement, Jesus made no further reply. At festival time, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone they asked for. Now a man called Barabbas was then in prison with the rioters who had committed murder during the uprising. When the crowd went up and began to ask Pilate the customary favour, Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realised that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over. The chief priests, however, had incited the crowd to demand that he should release Barabbas for them instead. Then Pilate spoke again. But in that case, what am I to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back. Pilate asked them, Why? What harm has he done? But they shouted all the louder. So Pilate, anxious to placate the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and having ordered Jesus to be scourged, handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him away to the inner part of the Paris, palace, that is, the praetorium, and called the whole cohort together. They dressed him up in purple, twisted some thorns into a crown, and put it on him and they began saluting him. They struck his head with a reed, spat on him, and they went down on their knees to do him homage. And when they had finished making fun of him, they took off the purple and dressed him in his own clothes. They led him out to crucify him. They enlisted a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, father of Alexander and Rufus, who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he refused it. Then they crucified him and shared out his clothing, casting lots to decide what each should get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription giving the charge against him read, the King of the Jews. And they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. The passers-by jeered at him. They shook their heads and said, The chief priests and the scribes mocked him among themselves in the same way. They said, Even those who were crucified with him taunted him. When the sixth hour came, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. This means, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? When some of those who stood by heard this, they said, Someone ran and soaked a sponge in vinegar and putting it on a reed, gave it him to drink saying, Wait and see if Elijah will come to take him down. But Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The centurion who was standing in front of him had seen how he had died, and he said, In truth, this man was a son of God. 
There were some women watching from a distance. Among them were Mary of Magdala, Mary who was the mother of James the Younger, and Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and look after him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women there who had come up to Jerusalem with him. It was now evening, and since it was preparation day, that is, the vigil of the Sabbath, there came Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who himself lived in the hope of seeing the kingdom of God. And he boldly went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate, astonished that he should have died so soon, summoned the centurion and inquired if he was already dead. Having been assured of this by the centurion, he granted the corpse to Joseph, who brought a shroud, took Jesus down from the cross, wrapped him in the shroud, and laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary of Magdala and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching and took note of where he was laid. Uh, would you like to sit down just for a few moments, please? Uh, the shortest line in the Gospels, I believe, is this, Jesus wept. Just Jesus wept. And once we say it, it summons up for us what the life of Jesus was like. Jesus had a great softness, a great humanity in him, a great care for everyone he met. And often he was saddened at the predicament of people in their poverty, in their pain, in their suffering, in their bereavements, and in the way that perhaps they were treated by those who were the wealthy and the powerful. And we find them here in the Gospel reading, particularly the women, that there were a number of women there who had been looking after him, catered for him during his traveling, and then there were the others who came up to Jerusalem. And they came there, I presume, because they were aware that their beloved Jesus, the soft and kind and gentle one, was in very big trouble. So that is what we are remembering in the Gospel today. And when we think back over his ministry, there are people mentioned there like Lazarus and Martha and Mary. And we are told that that is the place where he wept. And there were strange things because he delayed his coming when he was told about the illness of his friend Lazarus. And he even went aside to speak to Martha and Mary before he even visited the tomb or the grave of Lazarus. But when he did, he went and he wept, and he called Lazarus into life. I believe that that is what this feast is about, what that gospel is about. It's about the Jesus who cares for each and every one of us, who weeps at our times of sorrow and bereavement and hurt, or when we are betrayed, or uh, when we are abandoned, and all of the things that can happen to us through illness, uh, through the social constructs in which we live, the politics, and all of that, that he is full of sadness and sorrow and weeps. But the whole purpose of this, and we ask sometimes, why did it have to be this way for Jesus? Why did he have to suffer this way? It's a very important question. But I believe that somehow, through his tears, we are led to new life. So, he gave himself up completely, and there are all the signs of that in the gospel story we have just read. See how he is arrested, the gentle Jesus arrested. He was able to say, you, sure, I was in the temple with you every day, speaking to you and, and teaching you. Why do you come with all this armory uh, to take me away? And so they took him away, 
and he is stripped of his clothes, the indignity of that. And of course, among the Romans, that stripping of one's clothes was the ultimate indignity and shame. And they took off his clothes and put on royal clothes in order to mock him uh, in the purple and uh, pretending to, to knight him or make him a king by striking him on the head with a reed, which I presume was a stiff rod. And then when they had done that, they restored him and he put on his own clothes again. And isn't that a marvelous thing for any of us? to be able to put on our own clothes, just to be ourselves. And Jesus was now himself, for himself, and around his people and those who were mourning him, including his mother. So the whole message today is really this. Jesus is on his journey to the cross. He is on his journey to death. He is on his journey through all his times of tears and remembering the widow's son of name, uh, the cripple at the side of the pool, the deaf man who was sitting at the gate of the temple, the blind man, and all who were people greatly, greatly set aside and marginalized and not well looked after by society or even, or even family or, or the authorities. So he is leading us having given everything, and that's what he has done. He has given everything, including his life, and he has endured great pain and suffering in, in, in that whole journey. So he is with us in our pain and suffering, but he asks us to walk the journey with him. Walk with me, talk with me, listen to me, and go through your pain, carry it with you, because it is through your pain that you will come to the end of tears, and you will come to the world, to the kingdom that I have prepared for you since the beginning of the world. And leave it at that, because you know the story yourselves. Just think of the Jesus who wept and who continues to weep and is with us in our weeping too. So let us just stand now. And I'm going to do it this way. The creed is there, but Next Saturday night, we will be asked to renew our baptismal vows, and we'll be asked questions. And I'm going to ask those questions of you now, and you know the answer. Do you believe in God the Father, the Father of compassion, the Father of His Son, Jesus Christ, who loves us? Do you believe in the God who loves you with an everlasting love? And do you believe in Jesus Christ, His Son, whose story we have heard here this morning, and we hear it again and again year after year. Do you believe in the Christ who has wept, the Christ who heals, the Christ who invites us to love the Father and to know that we are always loved with an everlasting love? And do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit who puts a new heart in us so that we might weep with those who mourn, that we might walk with those who are in pain, and that we may give legs and power and strength to others as we meet them on our journey. So may God bless you for your faith. May you hold it, and may you celebrate it all during this week and beyond. And now let us pray. Jesus leaves us an example to follow. So may God guide us during Holy Week to listen and to listen to know and to follow his word. So we pray for all God's people carry crosses of any kind. May they know the strength of the Lord's endurance with them. Lord, hear us. For all who are sick, who are lonely or abandoned or have been treated with great treachery, may they receive the courage of God's suffering servant. Lord, hear us. And for all who enter on this Holy Week, that we may receive the forgiveness, the fidelity, and the friendship of Christ to witness to God his Father with a new enthusiasm. Lord, hear us. And for all peoples, that the love of God may be abundantly poured into every heart. 
May they know the love of God that is always present within them. And may we become a church that pours out with kind and gen kind generosity God's love on others. Lord, hear us. And we pray for those who have died. Today we have been asked to, to pray for uh, Bridget Doherty, whose anniversary occurs at this time. That's Bridget Doherty, the aunt of Geraldine King. And we pray for all those who have died. And we think especially those who during the past year have died through COVID. Uh, we pray that the Lord may welcome them into the joy and peace of his kingdom. May we pray for our family members who handed on this faith and this gospel to us. We pray for those who are our guides and our mentors and who looked after us with great courage, sometimes in the midst of suffering, that they too may receive that generous welcome to the banquet of God's kingdom in heaven. Lord, hear us. And we pray for all who are looking after the, the, the sick at the moment, particularly those who are suffering from COVID. We pray for the nurses and doctors and carers and the families who sometimes are unable to see their, their relatives, maybe even through to death or th through a long illness. Give them strength, Lord. Lord, hear us. So, Lord our God, by the precious and life-giving cross of your beloved Son, answer our prayers for the gift of loving salvation that we find in him. Let it be our strength as we follow and serve you during this Holy Week, both now and forever. Amen. So just be seated while we prepare the altar and put our gifts on the altar. My brothers and sisters, let us pray that our sacrifice uh, may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. So through the passion of your only begotten Son, O Lord, may our reconciliation be close at hand, so that though we do not merit this by our own deeds, Yet by this sacrifice made once for all, we may feel already the effects of your mercy. We ask this through Christ our Lord. And the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For though innocent, he suffered willingly for sinners and accepted unjust condemnation to save the guilty. His death has washed away our sins and his resurrection has purchased our justification. And so with all the angels, we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the cup once more, gave you thanks, gave the cup to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, as we celebrate this memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of love, together with Francis, our Pope, Lowell, our Bishop, all the clergy, and all here present. Remember your servant, Bridget, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that she, who was united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection. And remember also all our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Saint Joseph, our husband, with the blessed apostles and martyrs, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Jesus taught us to pray to the Father, so we join each other in prayer, acknowledging the Father who loves us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that, by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your Church, and graciously grant our peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. And peace be in your hearts and in your homes. Peace be in our land and peace throughout the world to all nations and peoples. May there be peace, both bodily peace and the healing of people. May there be peace among those who care for them. So may the peace of the deep rivers and the seas and all of God's creation be with you now and forever. Lamb of God, 
you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy that, by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Let us bow down and pray for God's blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people here present and those joining us in many different ways who have honoured the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. And the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. There will be a notice at the, in the porchway. If anyone is in difficulty or you know someone who is finding it difficult to cope financially due to the pandemic, St. Malachi's Conference of St. Vincent de Paul is here to help. We can provide financial assistance for heating, oil, electricity, or food vouchers. So please contact a member of the conference or call the helpline, which is on a notice at the door. All calls, we are assured, are treated in the strictest, strictest confidence. And we look forward to the other days of the week. I think the, uh, the, the, the Thursday service is at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. on Thursday for the Mass of the Lord's Supper, nine o'clock on Saturday evening for the vigil, the Easter vigil, and then 11 o'clock on Sunday morning for the Easter Sunday morning Mass. I forgot Good Friday, three o'clock in the afternoon, the traditional time, three o'clock. Anyway, may God bless you with a holy and secure and, and prayerful week. And thanks to you all for being here, for those who have participated either through music or reading or just being here helping us to pray together. And God bless you.